The first week of August 2021, a Chinese news-ish publication called the Economic Information Daily published an article in which it mentioned an online multiplayer video game called Honor of Kings, saying that children were playing this and similar games and becoming addicted, and it was ruining them as people. The article calling such games, quote, spiritual opium, end quote, before ending the piece with a call for more regulation on the video game industry within China to curb this issue. I say the Economic Information Daily is a news-ish publication because it's one of the many local news outlets that is affiliated with Xinhua, which is China's official Communist Party-run news agency, and the largest, and by virtue of that government affiliation, the most influential news agency in the country. This criticism, then, coming from this news affiliate, was taken very seriously by Tencent, the staggeringly large Chinese tech company that makes Honor of Kings, among many other titles. It's the country's largest video game seller by far, and one of the most valuable companies in the world. And Tencent seemingly took it so much to heart that it announced within hours of that article going live, and their stock prices plummeting as a consequence, the company losing about 10% of its overall value, which subtracted about $60 billion from its market capitalization. Within hours of that, they announced that they would be imposing new restrictions on how children were able to access and play their games. Among the specific restrictions they've announced in the weeks since is an augmentation of their existing child game playing limitation systems, strengthening their processes for weeding out kids who are lying about their age as a means of passing through the filter that they currently have in place, and decreasing the amount of time kids are allowed to play their games each day from one and a half hours, a limit that resulted from a previous government ruling on this issue that passed a few years back, down to one hour a day. Though that goes up to two hours on holidays, which is down from the previous three hours. And they said that they would support a ban on video games for children under the age of 12, though kids of that age are currently allowed to play in accordance with those aforementioned time limitations. But they are no longer able to spend money within these games after this new round of limitations. Most of these limitations currently only apply to Honor of Kings, which has been the country's most popular game for the past several years, and it's one of the most downloaded apps of all app categories on all app stores globally. But Tencent has said that they are in the process of reassessing their entire catalog to make sure their activities fall into line with the priorities the Chinese government is flagging to some of its biggest companies, indicating, basically, that things are going to change in China throughout their economy, and those who do not play ball who do not get their act together and squeeze themselves into the new structure that's being implemented will be trimmed away and replaced by another entity that will play ball and which will reorganize itself to match the new somewhat to very different standards that are being applied by newly empowered regulators throughout the Chinese government. What I'd like to talk about today is that wider crackdown, the ramifications of it, and the seeming implications of what the Chinese government is doing, trimming the wings of some of its most successful and valuable companies with the ostensible goal of building something new. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. 
but there's a list of other options, both monetary and non-monetary, at letsnotethings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance, if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from Bloomberg, and it's entitled Yuan's Global Use Faces Test as Xi's Reforms Rattle Markets. That headline would seem to be an understatement of what's happening in the Chinese stock market, but also what's happening to Chinese companies trading on other markets around the world right now, as of mid to late August 2021. Before I get into that, though, I think it might be a good idea to run through a very quick and dirty history of China's modern industrialization efforts, as that history plays a role in the story of what is playing out today. Now, this is a very superficial overview of a far denser and more interesting story, but post-revolution, Revolutionary leader Mao Zedong started utilizing a system of five-year plans based on a similar preemptive prioritization measures meant to help other collectivistic societies achieve their collective goals. Those goals recalibrated and restated every five years or so, and key to a successful outcome for China, in Mao's mind, was industrializing as rapidly as possible which looking around the world at the time was a pretty fair theory. So for the first five-year plan, introduced in 1953, there was a big focus on reorganizing the government, how and where people were living within China, and the nation's infrastructure, such as it was. And then the next five-year plan, announced in 1958, built upon that initial reorganization. This second collection of priorities and the way the government intended to make them happen, is often called the Great Leap Forward. And it was meant to shift the country out of its agrarian baseline. Most people in the country at that point worked on farms, and their labor was focused on just keeping everyone in the country fed, and they wanted to convert that into a more industrialized setup that would allow more of those people to focus on other things and it would allow them eventually to build a communist utopia, basically, which was the operating principle behind the Soviet Union and other communist governments' actions and plans at the time as well. The Great Leap Forward thus focused on the things Mao thought would allow China to shift to that next stage as quickly as possible, and that mostly meant industrialized agriculture and the production of steel at scale. This plan did not work. The whole country's effort and resources were redirected toward these two primary concerns, and the output they had expected from that focus did not materialize, which left them very short on pretty much everything. And that misallocation combined with a severe drought to cause a sprawling, series of famines, which are today typically bundled together and referred to as the Great Chinese Famine, which primarily affected the country from 1959 until 1961, causing somewhere between 15 and 55 million deaths. This is generally considered to be one of the most deadly man-made disasters in history. Post-famine, things picked up a bit, but not as dramatically as had been hoped by those who planned this series of national recalibrations. Folks did move away from agriculture and started gaining more skills that were relevant in the industrial world, and China's output of things like coal and steel and their production of electricity and fertilizer increased substantially. Their overall economy actually grew at something like 11%, per year, which is pretty astonishing. But their output had also plummeted quite a bit leading up to that growth, and even more steeply during their famine years. So this was a positive development by industrialization metrics, but not an objectively huge win. They were still quite small economically as a country, and they were just now starting to get their feet under them after a period of significant overall devastation. That 
Status, though, compared to other actors on the world stage anyway, changed pretty rapidly after the Chinese Communist Party, which ran the government, decided in 1978 to make some more fundamental reforms to the way the government and economy operated. In particular, they decided to shift away from a completely centrally controlled, planned economy, like the one Mao was trying to build, and to instead keep the communist underpinnings of their leadership system, but allow their economy to engage with other markets around the world more easily, with less friction, while also allowing market-driven elements into how they did things internally. So a nation still controlled by a single communist party leadership but an economy that is substantially informed by the same free market style forces that seemed to be working so well elsewhere around the world, including in relatively new Asian economic giants like Japan and South Korea and Singapore that were popping up seemingly out of nowhere in their neck of the woods and more or less demolishing China when it came to increasing the value of their economies and improving the quality of life for the people living under their governmental aegis. This shift, which included a whole lot of focus on local infrastructure, as well as the segregation of some parts of China into economic development zones, which essentially turned them into international trade and investment hubs, it worked a whole lot better than the Great Leap Forward. First, because there weren't any devastating famines, but second, because it allowed China to very, very quickly industrialize and grow wealthy, pulling a historic number of its people out of poverty in the process and becoming dominant internationally in many fields, in many facets of economic production, and more recently, in terms of research and development and innovation as well. Riding that multi-decade wave of development coming into the 2020s, it had become a truism that China would soon surpass the United States according to many different economic metrics, and that it already had according to a few others. So it's been a very productive and impressive four decades or so over in China, and that growth has put them, in the minds of some anyway, on a collision course with the U.S., and other major economies around the world. And that set the stage for a standoff between then-U.S. President Trump and the Chinese Communist Party General Secretary, the most powerful politician in China, Xi Jinping. They had what we might call a pissing contest that started in 2016 and ended when Trump left office. And that contest left a highly intertwined economic situation that had developed between China and the U.S. economies a lot less so. Demands were made on both sides, though perhaps a bit more vehemently from the United States, that the trade relationship needed to be brought into better balance to account for China's growth and increasing power on the global stage. And that led to a series of moves and counter moves that resulted in, among other things, a collection of sanctions against Chinese companies that left them without access to fundamental components and supply chains, leaving then-massive Chinese tech company Huawei without access to microprocessors and the Google app ecosystem, including the Android operating system, though that's just one of many examples of Chinese entities that were hobbled by this sequence of events that were catalyzed by this larger pissing contest. This is important to note because although it's a near certainty that this was already on the Chinese leadership's mind before those sanctions started falling into place, these limitations and the power that entities like the United States wielded diplomatically and economically underlined weaknesses in China's overall setup that allowed them to be hobbled incredibly quickly by a declaration by the U.S. president which meant no matter how much effort they put into building a mega-giant tech company like Huawei, and the government did help them grow, as they have done with most or all of their mega-companies, because that's just how things work within their system. No matter how big and powerful those companies become internationally, that size and power and wealth still would not protect them 
from the supply chain and R&D vulnerabilities that they could now see so clearly. After a year or two, living through a global pandemic, supply chain concerns have been on a lot of minds. As shortages have become more common, just-in-time shipping and supply systems have demonstrated their flimsiness, and folks in charge of entities as small as a local bakery and as large as the Chinese government have been made uncomfortably aware of just how great it would be to have more of what they need completely under their control, or at least a bit more under their control. The fundamental stuff that keeps society and the economy ticking, but also things that they might need next, where they're going, not just where they are today. For the baker, this might mean having better connections with local manufacturers of the ingredients that they need to keep their business open rather than leaving their financial well-being susceptible to the whims and winds of international shipping infrastructure. For the Chinese government, this might mean recalibrating things once more to account for this realization and for how the world seems to be changing around them. That attack against Tencent and their video games then, and the many other assaults against some of China's largest and most powerful companies, and the people who run them, by the Chinese Communist Party, would seem to be part of a larger plan to reorganize their economy once more. And based on what's recently been announced by the Chinese government, they're intending to pull back from that system they installed in 1978, which has served them so well in so many ways, according to some metrics at least. They seem to be pulling back from that in an effort to build something better, according to their definition of better that will also hopefully allow them to alleviate some of the downsides and excesses of that market-driven system that helped their big companies grow so massive, their economy grow so rapidly, and so many of their people to be able to emerge out of abject poverty. One of the first targets, based on a set of draft rules issued by Chinese regulators in mid-August, are Chinese monopolies and near monopolies that have dominated some sectors, gobbling up or killing off all competitors before they have an opportunity to come of age. Those draft rules were released on the same day the state-backed People's Daily newspaper said that the government would be tightening regulations on the country's entertainment sector, which has, among other things, cultivated a pop culture oriented around a sort of celebrity worship often called idol culture, a cultural norm that has been described by state-run publications using similar terms that they've recently applied to video games, criticizing the seemingly addictive behavior that surrounds and seems to emerge from both. We've also seen recent announcements related to banking and insurance, chip-making companies, dairy companies, vaping and alcohol brands, companies making sneakers and sportswear, fertilizer companies, tutoring companies, which are a big business in a country that imbues so much social meaning and status in how one does in school, food delivery companies, and the education tech sector, the last of which was overhauled recently so that companies teaching the school curriculum can no longer earn a profit, they can no longer raise capital, and they can no longer go public. They have to become nonprofits, essentially. Many of these changes seem to orient around the central themes of incentivizing a new type of competition in the Chinese economy while reducing a type of ostensibly harmful competition that exists between rivals and which often results in walls between hordes of data and other similar resources, which the Chinese government seems to believe should be centralized with them, so that all companies can make use of user data collected by any tech company, freeing these Chinese tech companies up to then build atop that collectively held resource, rather than using isolated data hordes as competitive advantages, which is part of what keeps smaller companies from being able to compete with tech supergiants and part of what incentivizes the abuse of such data, which is something else the Chinese government has said that they're trying to avoid. They can use the data however they like, but they don't want the tech companies to do the same. This gestures 
at a type of fairness that doesn't currently exist in the Chinese or most other markets around the world. It would be a fairly new sort of thing, and the logic behind it makes sense from some perspectives, but it does deviate quite a bit from the model that they've been using until now, and the economic competition-driven model used by most other economies worldwide currently. Many of these announcements also allude to the enforcement of a type of cultural purity that on one hand seems to demand that these companies treat their employees better, which is a shift we are seeing in many places around the world right now after a very long period of the opposite, arguably, but which on the other hand seems to be focused on regulating the behavior of individual citizens alongside the behavior of businesses. Kids can't play more than an hour of online video games a day, and drinking and over-the-top boisterousness should be avoided in work situations because it can sometimes lead to sexual harassment and abuse, which is another thing the government seems to be trying to regulate away after it emerged from the spiral of both market and latent cultural forces. The Chinese government also seems to be prioritizing what some analysts are calling deep tech, as opposed to what the government now seems to think of as frivolous or superfluous technologies, like those that provide food delivery, video games, or social networking apps. Such things are fine, but they would rather focus on the deeper and more future-facing worlds of quantum computing and some types of artificial intelligence, things that could potentially become the next electricity in terms of the advantages they provide to those who master and own them and who dominate in their innovation and production. So while the Amazons and Googles and Apples of the world, consumer technology giants oriented around consumption will likely remain incredibly lucrative undertakings China's actions seem to indicate that they are fine killing off locally grown golden geese of that variety if that will free up resources and attention for companies making what they now consider to be the vital stuff, hardware and software, that will define the next 50 years. The most immediate ramifications of this shift in posture for China is that many of their companies are seeing their market values crater, and some index funds and other powerful large-scale buyers are very publicly reducing their exposure to Chinese companies, in some cases to zero or near zero, explaining this decision by saying that there's no way to predict what the government is going to do next, so the risk of investing in any of these companies is now just too high, despite the gains that they have gleaned from these very same companies over the past decade or so. And those gains have in fact been substantial in many cases. It's also possible that China's already plateauing growth will stagnate still further as things are reorganized, new regulations are announced and implemented, and everyone involved struggles to find their footing within this new reality. Some of these changes are minor, but some have already been quite significant, and by all indications, they are at the very beginning stages of a huge and extended transformation that could touch just about every aspect of Chinese society, government, and the economy. It would actually be a bit surprising if they didn't experience at least a momentary blip on their otherwise impressive several-decade record as a consequence of these changes considering how substantial the changes already seem to be. Internationally, we may see the Chinese economy playing less well with everyone else's economy, as they pivot away from those 20th century dominating economic forces that made so many people and nations rich, but which also have some pretty significant downsides that we're seeing a lot of right now in terms of human cost, environmental cost, and in terms of the vast economic inequalities that seem to almost inextricably result from adhering to such rules and systems. The Chinese have said that they are keen to rebalance some of those imbalances, and that might mean further decoupling from other nations and other economies that are not similarly rebalancing.
Now that said, many countries seem to be in the midst of their own rethinking, if not complete rebalancing yet. In some cases, mulling and trying out new social programs. In other cases, merely shifting their priorities to focus more on disasters, ongoing and impending, and restructuring everything else according to that North Star. China's shift isn't the only one taking place right now, then, but it is because of the nature of their government, likely to be one of the most direct and rapid, because they're able to act unilaterally when it comes to most things, and history has shown them to be incredibly adept at readjusting their daily realities and long-term expectations when warranted. We'll have to wait and see if they prove capable of nudging other governments to adjust in similar or compatible ways as well, which is probably part of their larger strategy, according to some China analysts, at least. Of course, this could also blow up in their faces. There is also a history of that happening in China, and the international response to this shift has not been good so far. For those companies whose valuations are plummeting, but also for the global perception of the yuan, China's currency, which they've had ambitions to build up so that it is just as or more influential than the dollar, but which now seems like a bad risk for people and governments that might otherwise buy them up as a safe stockpile currency. That perception could change quickly if this recalibration ever looks likely to lead someplace secure and productive, but it'll almost certainly be at least a few years before even the first hill is crested in that regard. And in the meantime, it'll probably be a somewhat tumultuous ride for those holding yuan and for those who are in any way invested in other types of Chinese assets as well. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here on Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to leave a quick review wherever you get your podcasts. You can also share the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it, and or share your favorite episode on social media. But there's a list of both monetary and non-monetary ways of supporting this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. Great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called Nine Nasty Words, English in the Gutter, Then, Now, and Forever, by John McWhorter. This is the sort of book that, if you listen to an audiobook version of it, you probably don't want to listen to it where other people can hear it necessarily, because it does, in fact, repeat over and over and over again some very offensive words, but it does so in the context of explaining what makes them offensive, where they came from, the historical connotations and context surrounding them, and why it is that some words start out as offensive and then become not offensive, start out as non-offensive and become offensive. The author really knows what he's talking about here, and he discusses this topic in a very illustrative and educational way. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Nine Nasty Words by John McWhorter. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, wherever you get your podcasts or at brainlenses.com. You can sign up to receive a daily email from me in which I curate and summarize the news at onesentencenews.com, and you can feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. <music>